Okay. There we go. <laughs> All right, so she's spoken at the John Hopkins School of Medicine, Georgetown Hospital, and Craig Hospital, um, among others. And Maggie is creating The Great Now What, a documentary film about her experience with stroke, disability, loss, and resilience. And it is planned to be released in 2022. So she has been busy. Uh, but Maggie, I'll let you go ahead and take it away. Oh, okay, okay, great. Well, thank you everyone for having me. I'm so thrilled to be here today and so grateful to the Angioma Alliance community. And I know some of you uh, personally, so thanks for coming to my talk. Um, this is a kind of abbreviated version of the talk that I give at medical schools. And uh, I'm really happy to share it with you today. So here we go. I'm going to share my screen. Okay. So I, um, and I do one more thing. There we go. I'm really glad to speak to you in the month of September because September is Pain Awareness Month in the uh, country of the United States. <laughs> and uh, I don't know about you all, but uh, a result of my cavernous angioma um, hemorrhage is that I have really intense nerve pain all the time. And so I like to try and build awareness about pain in the month of September. So a little disclaimer that this is the story of my stroke and the story of my life, and it's quite personal. Um, and uh, that uh, I'm going to show a couple of of photos from my time in the hospital, um, but I'll give a little warning about that and none of them are too much. There's one of my scar, but that's about it. So I was born in 1981. I, in a little mountain town in Colorado, I was a super active child and I loved to ride my horse and play in the snow. And uh, I was a very uh, kind of theatrical kid as a child. As an adult, some words I would have used to describe myself would be bold. I took a lot of risks in my life and went on a lot of adventures. I had a lot of fun, loved to hang out with my friends and go out and have a party and, and enjoy the lighter side of life. I love to take fun pictures and make my friends laugh and, and just enjoy the lighter side of life. As a, as a job, I was an actor and uh, freelance director and producer. And, um, you know, a, as a woman and as an actor, your face and your body is kind of your whole career. Uh, it's very important what you look like and, and that, you know, as a woman, you're attractive. <laughs> and uh, being an actor, I was... Um, you know, I had some acting gigs, but in between I would be constantly working other jobs. So sometimes I would go from one job to another to another in one day. And sometimes I worked 80 hours a week and uh, I really thrived on that kind of lifestyle. I really loved the hustle of it. So here's a little video from uh, 2011 from a little improv comedy festival. You can see how my face used to move. <laughs> I hear they got some problems down in Lone Star State. I don't fix them. <laughs> uh, I was very much an athlete. Uh, I could pick up sports easily. I was a very competitive horseback rider until I was 21. Love to snowboard in the winter. By Western beauty standards, I was pretty smoking hot. <laughs> um, I had, uh, you know, very symmetrical face, beautiful smile, blonde hair, long legs, big boobs, kind of the whole package in terms of the traditional standards of beauty. I was very much a leader of other people, um, and I, I ran an improv comedy group for 
four years and I directed a lot of shows and produced a lot of shows. And so people look to me to be in charge of everything. Uh, these are some shows that I organized. The photo on the lower right is a group that I took on a, a, a tour to Taiwan. We were based in South Korea at the time. And, and so I, I arranged these, these opportunities for other people and I was a leader. I love to travel and I had done quite a bit of traveling on my own um, throughout my 20s and I loved seeing the world. Growing up in Colorado, I was very much an outdoors woman and loved to get outside and enjoy the the weather and the, and the you know, the beauty that Colorado has to offer in every uh, season. Uh, so you can get a sense of how my body used to move. This is a bit of a, of a dance performance in 2012. And this is done to some William Blake poetry. So I had this incredible body that would do exactly what I wanted it to do. And I had power and agility and grace and it was, I was so fortunate to have that body. So I'm 33 years old and life is good and uh, I'm going to graduate school in Washington DC and this uh, picture on the left is me and my classmates outside the Lincoln Memorial. And I have been dating this person uh, for several years and we just gotten engaged and we'd set a date um, for a wedding and uh, we sent out 150 save the date cards. And it was unfortunate because this wedding didn't end up happening. So you saw I like to say, take a goofy picture. Um, this was my goofy picture uh, for Christmas in 2014, I was uh, very proud of the fact that I could do a handstand. Um, my graduate school program was in acting and I, it was very physical, doing a lot of stage combat, movement, dance, and so I was very, very strong. And uh, we were doing Pilates three days a week. And so I was actually in the best shape of my life um, right before my cavernoma uh, hemorrhaged. So who I thought it was, was someone who never needed help myself. I'm always going to help others. I'm going to project this air of competence and assurance and, you know, efficiency in vulnerability to the world. Uh, I believe I'm super independent, that I can do anything, that I can accomplish anything if I just put my mind to it. I feel like I can control how the world sees me. Um, and I think I have my life plan set. I think I'm going to uh, go to school. I'm going to marry this guy. We're going to have some kids. I'm going to have my career. And I feel like I have it all figured out. So everything's about to change. Um, and it's the second day of Christmas break after my first semester of school. And I get a really bad headache. This is a Sunday morning and I don't feel good. And I think maybe I have the flu because uh, I didn't get my flu shot yet. And I was kicking myself for not getting that flu shot. And then by the next day, I'm still not feeling good. And I have no idea that I have a cavernoma in my head right now. Um, and I think maybe I'm just, you know, really tired from a, the semester in school and I just need to rest. But then I have this moment of imbalance on this second day um, and it comes and goes instantly. And I don't think any, I don't think a whole lot of it because it's never happened before and because it was instantaneous and then it was gone. Um, and I just thought that was kind of weird. <laughs> but then I, I go to bed 
early that night thinking if I just get enough rest, if I just drink enough water, I'm going to feel better in the morning. I get up very early in the morning to use the restroom and it happens again. I almost think I'm going to fall over. And I think, oh God, I think if it's like this tomorrow, I need to see someone. Um, and I get up in the morning, you know, I try and sleep in and I get up in the morning and it happens again. And I think, oh God, I have to see a doctor. And I've just gotten approved for new health insurance. And I call up the health insurance and they give me a list of doctors I can see. And I call a doctor's office and they say, we can see you in two months. And I say, I think I need to see someone today. And so they say, go to the ER. And so I walk from my apartment to the George Washington Hospital ER, which is thankfully only two and a half blocks away. I'm limping on my way there and I don't understand why. And I'm lucky in retrospect, I didn't fall over. Um, but I get there, I get checked in. I'm so young, I'm so healthy. No one thinks uh, I'm having a brain hemorrhage, you know? Uh, I get all kinds of different tests. Um, but by that evening, they give me a CAT scan and they say there's bleeding in your brain stem. And I don't understand what that means. Um, but they put me in the ICU that night just to observe me, um, and I get an MRI that evening. By the next day, uh, my condition has worsened, and my arm is very uncoordinated. My speech is very slurred. You can understand just a couple of words um, in a sentence. My vision has gone totally kaleidoscopic. Um, it's double, and I can't really see. And then by that evening, my body is being totally paralyzed. So then it's Christmas morning, right? <laughs> Merry Christmas, everybody. Uh, I, I, you can't understand a thing I'm saying. It's coming out like, rrr, 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 rrr. but I'm thinking the words in my head and I'm like, why doesn't everybody understand what I'm saying? Um, I really can't see, it's super disorienting. They have to put a ventilator down my throat because it can't protect my airway. My, uh, my face is totally paralyzed on the right side. My left side of my body is totally paralyzed as well. So I have a cavernous angioma and I don't know what that is. I've never heard that name before, um, but they say this is <laughs> what's in your head and that it's hemorrhaging. And they're showing me these pictures of a CAT scan and, a, and an MRI and Thankfully, my sister and my fiance's um, father have come in and are my advocates in the hospital because I can't communicate really anymore. I communicate through my hand, like a thumbs up sign, because I can't speak. And it's like, okay, here's a picture of what's going on in your brain. Um, and this is the scientific explanation of what is happening to me. Um, but I have really searched for what it feels like is happening to me. And the image that comes back to me over and over is a tsunami. A tsunami is just this giant thing that is coming at you and you can't hide from it. You can't uh, avoid it. <laughs> uh, and it's, it's gonna affect every part of your life. Uh, so this is a, tsunami, a picture of the tsunami in Japan in 2011. So I'm at GW Hospital. I get transferred to Johns Hopkins Hospital. I have an amazing neurosurgeon. Her name is Judy Huang. She's incredible. She specializes in all kinds of blood vessel problems in the brain, and cavernous angioma is one of the things she specializes in. And I have to have brain surgery. There's no other option. I will not recover. There's no possibility that I will recover. And I've had two hemorrhages in three days. And so her opinion and the opinion of the neurosurgery staff is that if we wait any longer, she's going to hemorrhage again and she'll end up either locked in or she'll die. Um, so brain surgery is the only option. And so we go in uh, for uh, this massive brain stem surgery. This is now nine days after uh, my initial um, symptoms. And it's like, how is it going to go? Who knows? <laughs> you know, everybody's hoping for the best. And the next picture is me a few days after my surgery. 
and it does, I do have a nasal tube in. So I have a feeding tube in my nose because I can't eat, you know, on my own. Um, I've lost a lot of weight because I've been paralyzed in a bed for two weeks. Um, and you can see my eyeballs are starting to point in different directions. And this is my final day in the neurocritical care unit. So here's my brain surgery scar uh, in the back. She, she cut uh, in the back, I got a midline suboccipital craniotomy. And she basically, you know, cut open the back of my head and then went in between the hemispheres to get down to my brainstem to remove the cavernoma. Um, and she removed basically all of it. And, uh, you know, it's, it's great. And I'm thinking I'm going to be able to get out of this hospital bed immediately. But as you can see, I'm like a limp noodle. This is me. Um, they're moving me from the bed to the chair in the hospital room. And it takes three people to move me because I can't move myself. This is a video of January 20th, and mom is here with me, and uh, we're taking this for archival purposes. I hope I am much improved when I look at this again. Love you, Maggie. Take care of yourself. We're recording. Okay. Hello, everybody. It's January 25th, and here's uh, where we're at with my leg. Nice. And with my arm. And it takes all of my strength to do that with my arm. And so I'm learning how to walk again. I've got a brace to hold my arm. Uh, I've got an AFO around my um, lower leg to stabilize my ankle. I have a quad cane for stability. And the wheelchair is right behind me because it's so exhausting just to take a couple of steps and at any point I just I need to sit down again. So uh, for those of you with brainstem cavernomas, um, perhaps your face got paralyzed. Uh, my face on the right hand side got paralyzed and I was so uh, traumatized by this paralyzed face and so horrified seeing you know, my reflection in the mirror and thinking I look like a monster. Uh, I have my fiance draw my facial nerve on my face to uh, try and like focus on it regrowing. But you can see by four months, I still don't have a blink. And I never thought about why my face moved or how my face moved. And suddenly I have this crash course in facial anatomy and where the facial nerve is and what it does. And uh, it's not anything I ever had to think about before. By six months, I'm doing better. I have a much smaller brace on my ankle and I'm using a single point cane now. Uh, for those of you with facial paralysis, um, I got what's called a, a, a hypoglossal nerve transfer. And uh, basically it helped my face regain symmetry. And you can see that um, yeah, the stroke was at Christmas um, and in June of 2015 is when I got the facial surgery. And you can see that over the course of the next six months, my face is like, it, it, the nerve is getting re innervated so the my face is is you know kind of coming back up into my head uh, to make it symmetrical. I also got two uh, surgeries on my eyeballs 
one on my left eyeball, one on my right eyeball a couple of months apart because my eyeballs are pointing in the wrong directions and they were not aligned in the socket. And, and we waited some time to see if my eyes would, would you know, be synchronized again, but they weren't. So then we had to get surgery on one eyeball, wait a couple months, surgery on the next eyeball. So by March, 2016, I have a symmetrical face and I have two eyeballs pointing straight ahead. But, you know, and the medical community has put me back together, quote unquote, but I don't feel put back together. I feel, I feel like my entire life has been shattered in a million pieces and it is impossible to put my life back together. So I struggle to explain to people how my life has changed and what it's like now. So I, I, I'm creating different pieces of art. And this is one of them because I want to communicate to people what double vision is like. Um, and, you know, I got the eyeball surgeries and they helped a lot, but I still have double vision when I look down. So this is uh, how it looks in my stairwell in my apartment building. There's my iPhone. This is a big reason why I have no desire to drive. There's my sister and her friend. So the vision is a big part of it. And then the body, this new body that I'm in that is so different and it looks approximately the same, but it feels and behaves totally differently. So how do I communicate that to people? And I start making these Barbie doll art projects. And this one is about the heaviness um, and the numbness that I have in the left side of my body because I have no proprioception anymore and my limbs are just pulling down on me all the time. And like I said, I have nerve pain and the nerve pain often feels very tight. So I made this Barbie of uh, rubber bands. These are vice grips. And then there's this constant burning sensation. Um, and there, this is a painting to describe the, the burning sensation. So then, you know, my life has changed so radically and emotionally, I would say it's been the toughest part of it is the emotional struggle about the change, you know, and, and so I was an actor, I had a headshot, which is a picture of your face that you give at auditions, um, to show people who you are, you know, uh, in the hopes that you'll get hired. And so I have a stack of headshots that are now totally useless because my half of my face is paralyzed. I don't look the same. And so I look at these headshots and they just make me so sad. And so I decide that I'm going to disassemble them and reassemble them in different ways to try and communicate to the world how I feel, how my, my psyche feels. And my psyche is very shattered by this experience. So I'm on Facebook. I know I've talked to some of you on Facebook. Um, and Facebook often shows me pictures of my old life. And uh, <laughs> I, I sometimes feel sad when I see these pictures, but I love this. Um, quote by Theodore Roosevelt that comparison is the thief of joy. I think a lot of people with a brain hemorrhage, um, you know, they feel hopeless afterwards because they try to get better, they want to get better, and after a while you realize you're not going to return to where you were and you start to feel hopeless. There's a lot of shame involved. You have gone, you know, in one day from someone who is functioning in society to someone who can't feed yourself or dress yourself, or maybe you can't work, can't drive a car, maybe you can't even move. Um, and it's like a mountain of shame on top of you. It's very isolating to go through this experience and, uh, and feel so separate from everyone else in society that, you know, you used to have the kind of same experiences as your peers. And now suddenly they're over here having this experience 
you know, they're getting married, they're having their first kid, they're buying their first house, and I'm over here having a very different experience. There's so much grief involved. Um, you lose a lot, you know, depending on the severity of your, of your brain bleed, you can lose your job, you can maybe lose your whole career, you can lose your spouse, lose friends, and lose your physical body, the and the vision and the voice that you used to have, and it's a lot of loss all at once. And that loss can translate into a lot of anger and rage. So, uh, you know, I had a brain bleed, um, but because of the size of it, it's, in a, it's a stroke. My, my cavernoma bleed was a full-on stroke because it was so big. So I often hear the term stroke victim and I don't like it very much. And I, I, I wish that everyone would uh, replace uh, that word with stroke survivor. I'm a stroke survivor. So this slide, I've been giving this presentation for a couple of almost two years. And uh, this slide was not in my presentation at the beginning. And I added it about three and a half years after my um, brain surgery. And, uh, you know, it's not something I would have said to myself one year out or two years out, but now I'm five and a half years out. And it's true that life does go on and you have to just figure out how to deal with the life that you have now. So I showed you some pictures of my previous life and maybe I thought that life was over for a while, but that's not true. Um, you know, I'm still bold. And you could consider it the boldest thing in the world to tell a bunch of strangers the gruesome details of the worst moment of your life in the hopes that it will build compassion and empathy. I'm also on stage again as an actor with Family Theater Company, and uh, they're just a wonderful company to work with. I also, uh, I can get outdoors on a recumbent tricycle, which has been an amazing um, thing to have and I would highly recommend it to anyone who can't ride a traditional bicycle anymore. Uh, it's a great way to get outdoors and be physical and exercise and and also just feel a little bit ind more independent. You know, I can't drive a car anymore, but I can tool around on my recumbent trike and, and that's uh, that's empowering. So many of you know that I am making a film about my experience. Um, it's not complete yet, but it will be soon. Um, but we do have uh, this video just as a little taste.
So that's my presentation. Uh, thank you so much to NGOMA Alliance. I'm so grateful to the organization for all it does for everyone in cavernous NGOMA. And I'm so grateful to all of you for coming and, uh, and I'm excited to have our discussion now. So thank you so much. <laughs>